Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm excited to speak uh, with you today about virtual reality. Uh, this is a talk about the future, as you could see from the title. Um, and I've spoken here for several years already on video games, but I really want to focus this one on what I think is a really exciting promise of virtual reality, and also to push your imagination. Everything I'm going to talk about today is really a develop in development. So this is really a talk about tomorrow. I want to frame this from the concept of what I view as a global challenge, and that is to enhance cognition. And I'd say this is a big, big challenge. Put it up there with climate change is something we should be focusing on. And I want to be clear here that I'm not talking about just increasing knowledge or information. I'm really talking about improving the function of the mind, how we perceive, how we think and feel, and then how we act. And across all these domains where we should be trying to improve cognition in young developing minds, in healthy adults, and in people that have deficits, I feel we could do a lot better. A lot better than transferring information content or trying to mask symptoms using nonspecific drugs. I think that we can actually improve those core functions of the human mind. Our attention, our perception, our memory, decision making, emotional regulation, and at the very highest level, empathy, compassion, and wisdom. And that's what I want to talk to you about, VR in that domain. So how do we do that? And you know, just the very basic question, can we use technology in general to accomplish those really high-level goals? I would say we can, and obviously most of you that are here today feel that this is possible, or at least worthy of conversation. Before I move on and talk about all the, what I think are exciting opportunities, it's worth pausing and noting the challenges that technology has placed on our brains and our minds. I published a book last year called The Distracted Mind, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World, which is really an evolutionary perspective on the strengths, but also the limitations of the human brain and how technology has challenged us. And I think it's a really important conversation to use as a jumping off point for this one, because until you recognize the challenge, the negative consequence of technology, you can't really, I feel, develop in a well-informed way. Um, a friend of mine who I'm gonna talk about later, John Favreau, the writer, actor, director, producer, um, once said this, uh, both in, a, in an interview with me as well as uh, uh, one with the New York Times, uh, that he felt that he wants to find the humanity in the technology. And it's a really beautiful sentiment, and I'm gonna come back to it, and I think in some ways that's what this entire talk is about. How do you use technology um, and, or leverage existing ones to really develop these higher order abilities of what, what makes us most human. So what I want to do now is uh, step through how the technologies of not just virtual reality, but also augmented reality, motion capture, wireless physiological devices, artificial intelligence, all of which are part of an ecosystem, as, at least as I view it, how they can be used to improve cognition. Some might ask, how, how do we even begin this conversation? How is that possible? And you know, the devil's in the details, but at the most basic level, it's really not that complicated. It's because this technology can be used to create very powerful experiences. And as we all know, experience is really the gateway to our brain's plasticity. When I say we all know, I mean that it is a non-contentious point amongst neuroscientists. Experience really drives plasticity. There are other driving forces. Injury also drives plasticity as compensation. But we know how strong this relationship is between experience and plasticity. First of all, it's the entire basis of all of our therapy and education and learning systems right now. But you can have uh, an experience, witness a single tragic event that detrimentally impacts the function of your brain for the rest of your life. Right? We call that post-traumatic stress disorder. And so if you can have an experience so powerful to lead to all those negative consequences, then can we use technology to build powerful experiences, targeted, personalized experiences, to harness plasticity in a positive direction to enhance our cognition? And that's really what I'm going to focus on. And what I'm going to do is step through three examples of virtual reality projects, some uh, that I'm uh, involved in and others that I'm not, to give examples of how we might step into this future of using virtual reality to create experiences to enhance cognition. So the first domain is attention, perception, and memory, our core cognitive abilities that uh, we depend on in everything we do um, and really, in many ways, defines us uh, in the most fundamental way. 
So to improve these abilities, uh, I have pretty much dedicated uh, most of my, my career now, and, and we have a center at UCSF called Neuroscape, where we try to bridge technology, all the technologies that I described to you, with concepts and methodology from neuroscience to improve brain function. I think it's helpful just to see a bit of what this lab looks like. It's not a standard laboratory. This is our new neuroscience building at UCSF, and this is one of our three Neuroscape research labs, which basically looks like an interactive media, media studio, but in there we present media that we create, closed loop interactive experiences to drive brain plasticity, improve cognition, and then record in this experimental room on the opposite side of the control room in real time all the changes that occur in brain activity and other aspects of physiology and cognition. Most of what we do is really about game development. We think that that particular form of technology is going to have great impact in this domain. Um, but we have now, as I described, moved beyond just games as a core and into how do we use other technology like virtual reality. So as one example of that is a game that we're currently developing called Labyrinth. Labyrinth is a virtual reality game where you navigate through 3D worlds using, in this case, an HTC Vive, and you could see a Virtuix Omni. So it's an omnidirectional treadmill. We think that this value to not just navigating with your fingers, but using your whole body, that our brain works on this perception action cycle, and we'll have better benefits if we have full body activation. And so how Labyrinth works, you can turn the volume on this. How Labyrinth works is that you navigate this environment, and as you figure it out and learn how to use these clues, it gets more and more complex. The hypothesis is that because, evolutionarily speaking, the hippocampus and memory system was really uh, evolved for spatial navigation, if we can improve these abilities in a rich enough environment, it will lead to benefits in memory outside of spatial navigation. So it's a hypothesis, right now it's a tech development project, but we think that this could have benefit in people that have early Alzheimer's disease, and that's where we're going with this particular project. We want to take it st one step further. We have another technology called the glass brain, where we can record someone's real-time brain activity using mobile wireless EEG while they play a game like Labyrinth, and overlay it on the MRI image. What this allows us to do is see in real time what's going on in someone's brain, so hopefully we can take this data, and this is another research project, and use it to guide the experience, how challenging is it, and the rewards. I just have one example of this, which is just too perfect to play at a VR meeting. This is uh, Mickey Hart. He's the drummer from The Grateful Dead. You can see he's wearing an EG headset, as well as an, uh, an Oculus Rift. This screen is actually so big you can't see the other end of it, but over there you would see Mickey's Virtual Reality World, which is a drumming game that we developed in our center. But he can't see the audience, you know, he's in his virtual world playing. And sitting next to him is Tim Mullins, an engineer that worked with us on this project, and he's wearing a virtual reality headset. But he's not seeing Mickey's game, he's flying through Mickey's brain in real time. So it's sort of like a neuro nest of dolls. Mickey's in his virtual reality world, and Tim is in his virtual reality world, which is Mickey's brain. You can imagine a therapist interacting with a patient, seeing their brain responding in real time, and then with a virtual dashboard, just pushing the levers to increase the challenges that they experience, and then see how their brain responds. Again, this is really a proof of concept, but it is a data visualization tool in virtual reality that lets us fine tune that experience that we're also creating in virtual reality. Next. I want to talk about these three concepts, stress, restoration, mood. We've quickly realized that if we're going to put all these challenges on the brain to try to push the abilities and drive the uh, enhancement of attention, memory, perception, you need to restore, right? The physical fitness world knows this very well. They have an entire field developed around in interval training where you need to push restore, and then re-engage. And we think this is going to be also equally important, especially with an experience as, uh, as deep as virtual reality. If you create a challenge, you need to restore. And so how do we do that? Well, one idea that I had in a literature that I was attracted to um, led to the development of this brand new company called SenseSync. And what we're trying to do at SenseSync is to follow up on this message from the literature, that exposure to nature is restorative on cognition, on mood, on stress, and there's many reasons for that. I won't describe all of that now, but we think it's an inspiring idea. But the challenge is, if you think about virtual reality in nature, is that virtual reality is really a two-sensory experience, sound 
and sight. And this is a great limitation, because as we all know, life is a multi-sensory experience. And so we have to think about sight, sound, touch, and smell all together, what we think of as sensory synchronization, thus sense sync. How do we bring them all together to create a truly immersive experience that's so bottom up, demands your attention outside of all the top-down things going on in your mind, that it fully allows you to restore and then re-engage with whatever that may be. And so we're building a technology which I think of as a deep brain massage, which is essentially a pod that presents all of these different sensory modalities in virtual reality. We can then use other technologies, physiology, to record your experience in the moment. And in a closed loop, help shape this environment, this experience, in a perfect way to lead to the most restoration. Again, a very early idea. If anyone's interested in this, I'd love to hear from you. OK, the last one that I want to describe is sort of the highest level of what I would say of what humans are capable of. This ability of feeling for another person um, as if they were yourself, and wisdom. And I think that uh, the potential for virtual reality in this domain is amazing. You've already heard some examples of that. And there's many different ways that this might occur. I want to talk about one particular one. And I want to do it from an example, again, of a friend of mine, John Favreau. So has anyone seen Gnomes and Goblins here? I really encourage you to download this demo. And a lot of you haven't seen it, so I'm going to show you a clip from it. But this is a, a creation of John Favreau, produced by Weaver and Reality One. Um, it is just a demo now, but it's being developed more. It's not really a game. It's more of a virtual reality experience. But first, I want to show you how beautiful the world they created. And then I want to make one point about the potential. Not that it might not even be their goal to build empathy and compassion, but I think there's great potential with this particular technology. So just take a peek at Gnomes and Goblins. OK, so you can see it's a, it's a beautiful VR world, um, really enticing and exciting to be in. But what you can't understand from this demo is what's actually going on. So what's happening is you have this interactivity with this, let's see if I can bring this up without starting it, with this creature over here. So um, they actually uh, were able to share with me some of the wireframes that go on behind the scenes. So that's what I'm going to show you in a very short clip. So what happens when you play Gnome and Goblins is that you're interacting with essentially an artificial intelligence that's driving this goblin. But because your head is being tracked, you know, one day certainly your eyes, but certainly now your head and your hands are being tracked, this AI, this intelligence in this creature that you interact with around the nut that you saw in the, in the clip um, can actually be a, a very deep, engaging experience because of where your eyes and hands are are being transmitted and in a closed loop system is driving the behavior of this virtual reality creature. And it's really an amazing experience. So I encourage you to um, uh, try it out. And I think that this is another example of how we could create and merge AI and VR to build an experience that helps you develop engagement and compassion in a really, really unique way that we've never seen before. So just watch this little guy as he interacts uh, with, with a player's uh, headset and their hands. It's tracking you. Oh, move your hand. Hand again. <laughs> little belly rub. Look up. Oh, here's the nut. Oh, thank you. So anyway, I think you could see there, even though it's not you, how absorbing that is. So I think that, again, another really exciting potential, not even through gameplay, but just interactivity, and I think an amazing use of AI to not replace us, but just to really help enhance what makes us most human. 
And with that, I think that this at least hopefully ignites your imagination of some of the promise of virtual reality into enhancing our cognition. Thank you for your attention.